All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our now virtual star party here in the beginning of February. Uh, I am your host tonight, uh, Thaddeus. I will uh, be guiding you on a on the future of space. I will probably not say it like that too many times because even I know that gets a little annoying. Um, but I am here at the wonderful Bell Museum um, where we uh, will be broadcasting from. Uh, we've got a great time tonight set up. Uh, we've got some great speakers from the University of Minnesota who are gonna be talking about uh, their research and the future of space. So normally, normally that time. We're gonna give a few more minutes here um, for anyone to log in that wants to, to get logged in here just at the beginning. Um, I see we're already bumping up to almost 100 folks. So welcome everyone. Um, I hope you're all staying warm on this very, very chilly uh, February, Friday night. Uh, just a few more months of this weather and, and then it'll be slightly less cold and then we'll go to the humidity and the heat and uh, then we'll be back to the two weeks of fall where it's absolutely beautiful and we all love it and it, and it keeps us sane. And then we go back until, and it's just gonna be, it, well, just hold it together for a little while longer, everybody. Um, as you are getting in, um, we have a Zoom webinar going here. Um, along the way, we're gonna have uh, time for questions throughout this. So you might wanna check out the bottom of your screen um, or you, may, you might need to swipe over if you're on a, a mobile device, um, but look for that QA tab there. The Q&A uh, is how we're gonna be asking uh, and answering questions this evening. Um, so you can put them in there uh, now and as we go along, questions about space, questions about what our speakers are talking about, questions about what I'm saying, uh, questions you've got about anything uh, really astronomy related. And uh, in fact, just to make sure uh, that you can all see me um, and that I know what's going on, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the chat even. So if you don't mind just throwing something in the chat there saying hi, letting us know you're there, letting us know that you that you exist, that you you you're ready for this. Um, I'm here in many, I'm here in St. Paul. Um, I don't know where you all are from. Uh, I'm I'm always I always love seeing if someone's like from I don't know Alaska, uh, if they're from uh, Richmond, California, um, off over on the West Coast, where I don't know the weather in which Richmond, but I'm going to assume it's not uh, three degrees outside there. Uh, I hope it isn't. I wouldn't put I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Um, we'll be, we'll be talking about pigs in space. I don't know, actually, but, uh, stay tuned for that. Um, all right. And lots of folks over here from Minnesota, uh, Eden Prairie, Dinah, uh, Stillwater, Spring Lake. Um, I saw, did I see, was that Bloomington? I saw further up there, uh, over in Whittier. Hey, uh, uh, close by where I hang out a lot. Whittier neighborhood. Uh, and someone from Roseville right up the street there. And then someone is from, did I get that right? Malaysia and Newfoundland. We have someone from Newfoundland. What? I don't mean to sound so shocked here, but how? I'm, we're not how, it's Zoom. Maybe not why, it's gonna be a great evening. How did you find out about us? Um, that's very cool. Uh, all right, um, some folks from a nearby area. Oh, everyone from Chicago, hi. Um, we are better than the Adler, so just go there and let them know we told them that. Um, don't mention my name though. Let's say, say Bob said that or something. Um, all right, some folks from Delaware, uh, Florida. Oh, these search of Eventbrite for astronomy. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that came up that way. That's awesome. All right, uh, you know what? It's been a few minutes here. I, we've got a lot of folks in, so I see. If, well, I see a few more trickling in, but uh, I'm going to keep moving on. Um, we're together for maybe about an hour tonight. Um, the primary reason that we're actually maybe stepping down to about an hour is because. Um, oh, well, let me come back to that actually. Um, because unfortunately, we do not have our telescope set up tonight. Um, for anyone out here, you may be looking outside and you may be seeing that the conditions are very clear. It was a pretty nice night when I was coming in, but I will direct your attention to this column right here and the feels like temperature where with the wind chill, um, it brings it down to below zero. And as it turns out, our telescopes don't operate at that temperature. And more importantly, our very wonderful telescope operators, uh, who uh, actually tonight we've had several students from the university as well, also running our telescopes. Um, they also don't operate at negative uh, below zero. Uh, it just, it's not, um, they, they are only human. 
So we took pity on them and, and we, we, we like them. So, uh, so we did not set up our telescopes tonight. I am sorry for that. Uh, fingers crossed next month um, and stay tuned for a little more information on that. Next month, maybe uh, weather as always permitting. Um, and don't, don't despair though, I will be talking about some of our, uh, some, th some things you can see in the sky tonight, um, whether you are here in clear skies um, or if you've got um, really access to the internet and wanna see some cool stuff up there. All right, um, and over there to Helen, um, we are not being hacked. Actually, you will be seeing a lot of Schitt's Creek tonight um, because I have a little too much free time on my hands occasionally. Uh, but for uh, what else we are doing tonight, um, uh, let's see if we can run a little backwards here. Uh, we have got two great guest speakers here. Um, so not a uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting your name horribly wrong after everything I did here. Um, Tyla, um, if you want to unmute and introduce yourself, get your name correct, because I apologize. Uh, tell us a little, what are, what are you going to be talking about later tonight? Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Sanat Aitala. I'm a PhD student at the U, and I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the work that I'm doing, as well as some of the work that's been done about uh, learning about Martian geology. All right, Martian geology. So for you Mars fans out there, ooh, you're gonna get a chance. If you've got questions about Mars, um, whatever questions you have, we will answer every single one of them. Uh, Matt Metzler, uh, undergrad here at the U, at, well, I say at the U, uh, University of Minnesota, up in Duluth, actually down in the, the cities right now. Um, do you wanna take a moment to introduce yourself? Say hi. Hello everyone, my name is Matthew Metzler and tonight I will be presenting on the geology of Venus. So I'm looking very forward to doing that tonight. All right, so we've got geology. So if you are a fan of rocks, um, whether you enjoy staring at them, whether you enjoy walking on them, uh, rock fans rejoice. Uh, the, the rock would be the, the, like, the stuff outside, not the music, just like, so to be clear here. But if you've got music questions too, you know what, throw them at us and uh, we'll do our best to answer that. Um, I do, so I wanna go back a little bit here briefly for what we can see in the sky, you know, it is clear. So if you've got a chance to get outside, um, I, I highly encourage you to take that chance, um, bundle up warm. Um, it is very cold out. Um, if you know anyone that needs warm clothes, please also take a moment and help, help out your neighbors. Um, we are uh, here looking at the sky. Um, oh, we've got one of our star maps up on the screen. And uh, we can, you can download your own star map over at bellmuseum.umn.edu slash star dash map. We'll also put that link in the chat. Um, best viewing times right now for the star map we have is around 6.30, 7 o'clock, uh, which oddly enough is the same time we set up this star party for. I, I don't know how that happened. Um, but I'm also being reminded, thank you for that, Katrina. Um, our event is live captioned. Um, so if you, uh, you might be seeing those captions at the bottom of your screen, you can also turn them on and off if you're not seeing them if you, or if you don't want them. Uh, look at the bottom of your screen for a live caption transcript button there, um, and you can toggle that on and off. I know especially sometimes on uh, mobile devices that is, uh, can be a, sometimes a little much. So, so swipe over and look for that. Uh, look for that option. All right. Um, and again, for those, I think we've got, we've got tons of folks in here. So for those uh, just joining us, um, some of you have already found it, but as well throughout the night, for all those questions that we have, um, please uh, check out the Q&A button down at the bottom of the Zoom screen among on those controls there. The Q&A button is going to be the best way to, uh, to, to ask questions um, because we do have the chat open, but uh, if that starts getting busy, you know, we're gonna, that's gonna, that's gonna get overwhelmed pretty quickly there. So uh, use the Q&A for your questions. Um, oh, and along with that, you know, let me just say there with the chat, um, I, you know, we're all competent Zoom users these days, definitely, we all know how to use it. Um, but just remember to keep it, keep it polite in the chat. Um, if we need to close it, we will have to, but I don't think we will. Um, unless, um, although actually this does remind me here, um, if I hear anything about Pluto and its status or about the difference between brown dwarfs and Jupiter type planets and where that cutoff is, and if anyone so much as mentions string theory or quantum loops, uh, I will stop this Zoom immediately and we will all go back home. Okay, good. 
Okay, with that, um, what's in our sky tonight? There is a lot up there. Again, if you've got a chance to get to that star map yourself, um, there is a lot up there to see. Our bright winter constellations in particular are visible, uh, looking over to the south and southeast. <laughs> um, oh, Eleanor. Uh, looking over to the south and southeast, we have Orion and his three belt stars, probably the I, I mean, I will say personally, the first thing you should look for outside of here in the winter, because it is easy to find and he's always great to see Orion there in the sky, um, the winter maker to the to the Ojibwe. Um, alongside him, we have uh, going down, we have Sirius near the southeastern horizon, above him Aldebaran in Taurus the Bull. Coming across the sky as well, there are a lot of things we can see in the city, but that grayish band there is not. That does mark out the path of our Milky Way galaxy. So if you wanna see that, you're gonna to wanna to get away from city lights. And I think some of you, especially I saw some folks from Stillwater. Um, Stillwater is you know, good sized town there, um, but you have a lot less light pollution and traveling between some Twin Cities and Stillwater or up north, if you go further north, we have some amazing dark skies here in Minnesota. And it is in that way, uh, a little bit easier to see the Milky Way if you can just travel away from the city lights. Um, you can track those bright stars um, in the milk, or you can find the Milky Way by looking for some of the brighter stars in it. Um, on our star map, those bright stars are usually are the named ones, most likely, um, and they're the ones that have a little bit more of a different, they have a different shape, a little spiky uh, shape to the star, not just a round dot. Um, so you can see that again, if you go back to Orion there to the south and southeast, um, that would be Betelgeuse and Rigel at his shoulder and foot, respectively. Um, that, uh, that make him so easy to see. Yes, no, I should say, the reason I, I say no talk about quantum loops is because I don't understand them and I don't want to tr even try to explain them. Um, if you have got the star map here, there's a lot up there to see. If you're wondering how to use it though, um, it is remarkably simple. This map here does mark out the sky all around us, but then brought down on a piece of paper. So the outer edge, the ring of this star map that we see here, uh, this line, uh, which hopefully my drawing, there we go, this line over here, this is the horizon in any direction, whether south, southeast, west, northwest, north, and so on and so forth. So that horizon there is what you'll see just as you look straight out around you. Looking at the center of the map though, right about here, uh, where Perseus is on the map and in, in this map here, that is the zenith or the top of the sky. So if you were lying down and looking straight up, that's what you would see up there. And so to use a star map like this to find things in the sky, you have to find some sense of direction, uh, which is easier or harder depending on who you are. <laughs> I'm on the, the harder side of that. Um, I suggest looking for Orion though. There's a reason I started with him, right? Orion is pretty nicely there to the Southeast. So if you can see Orion in the sky, look for those three, three belt stars, three stars right in a row. You're gonna hold the map up in front of you with Southeast at the bottom of the map. So it'll actually be tilted a little bit. You'll, you'll tilt the circle a little bit. Um, and then as you hold it there with southeast at the bottom, you'll see Orion above him in the southeast on the map, and you look up in the sky, and there is Orion right there. So whatever is at the bottom of the map as you're holding it is the part closest to the horizon. Um, and as you spin around, for example, if you want to find the Big Dipper or some major, um, you can look to the north, or conversely, you can find the north, you can find the Big Dipper first, Flip that map around so north is at the bottom, look up, and there is the Big Dipper. So you will need to turn the map around as you turn yourself around into different parts of the horizon. All right. Um, yes, we will try to use, we will try to annotate um, as possible, uh, especially as we go along to show some more things in the sky. And I believe our presenters too have got some annotations ready for us as well. Um, now, oh, thank you, uh, 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 Kristen. Chris Kristen there, um, mentioning Polynesian star maps because this brings me to something else. Um, I, trust me, this was not a setup here. Uh, this is the sky, the constellations as put together by the International Astronomical Union. Uh, this is a group of astronomers uh, about a hundred years ago who uh, drawing on Western Roman Greek 
uh, Egyptian, Babylonian traditions, that, that those cultures, um, they, they standardize the set of constellations. But they are not the only way to see the sky. In fact, you know, I'm right here at the Bell Museum. The Bell Museum itself sits on the traditional and treaty lands of the Dakota people. Um, the Dakota people right here in, many, in the Twin Cities, uh, Ojibwe people, the Anishinaabe further to the north, um, Lakota, Diné, Pueblo people in the southwest, uh, and people across the world, from Chinese astronomers to African astronomers to the South American astronomers, every single group of people had their own way of seeing the night sky. And it was incredibly important. To, it has been incredibly important to every culture across the world, across time. Uh, in the past and right now for folks living right now. Um, so let, let's take a moment and acknowledge that. Acknowledge that we don't have, a, we don't have the one way of looking at the sky. Um, if you would like to learn a lot more about um, some of these uh, indigenous ways of knowing the night sky, I'll direct you to one of my favorite groups ever, Native Sky Watchers at nativeskywatchers.org. Uh, a program run by Dr. Annette Lee. Um, uh, she has worked tirelessly over many years here to gather the fragmented knowledge that remains um, from uh, particular Ojibwe and Dakota uh, a culture, uh, cultures uh, along with others, um, and, and giving us a way, another way to understand the sky that we all see above us and also our beautiful state as well. Uh, indigenous knowledge of Minnesota, our beautiful, beautiful Minnesota Makoche. Um, that knowledge is embedded within their, their cultures as well. So, so take a moment, um, remember that we're not the center of the universe in many, many respects. Um, and, and take a moment here to search out some different resources. You know, someone out there posted a great one to, uh, to Paul and you, well, I will say, great. I have not had a chance to look at it, but I'm going to, I'm going to trust the, I'm going to trust our, our folks online um, for Polynesian star map for navigating um, Pacific Islanders had to find their way across the oceans. They did it using the stars. Uh, so ch check that out. Check that out. It is incredible um, how much we don't know in our everyday lives. All right, um, but for some things we do know, um, let's head over, uh, I will pause here uh, if you've already gotten tired of me, don't worry. We're gonna head over to Matt Metzler, um, undergrad 22, studying geology at UMD um, and some of his talk on Mars, or excuse me, on Venus, on mapping Venus. All right, Matt, are you ready? Yep. Here, All right, take it away. Yep, here, get the PowerPoint up here. Well, hello everybody. My name is Matthew Metzler and I will be presenting on the extraterrestrial mapping on Venus. So a little bit about me. I don't know if you can see my screen here. Um, I am a student at the University of Minnesota Duluth. I am pursuing my bachelor of sciences degree in geology with an environmental science minor. And I look to graduate with honors this spring. I specialize in economic and exploration geology with a very deep love of mineralogy. I am currently working with a gold exploration company here in the state called Vermilion Gold on a glacial geology research project. And I am currently a moderator of the Young Mineral Collectors Facebook group. Ooh. And then I was also a former geology club president and secretary of SME at UMD. So, how I got into mapping extraterrestrial environments is kind of interesting. So as mentioned previously, my main focuses are in mineralogy and terrestrial ore deposits. However, the great global germ invasion of 2020 provided a challenge with a thing that I have to go through for my degree called field camp. So because we had to do a virtual field camp, my department up in Duluth offered a course that counts for half of the field camp credits. And one of the instructors specialized in the geology of Venus. Her name is Dr. Hansen. And without her, I would not be here today presenting to you about this wonderful topic. So what is extraterrestrial mapping? Uh, extraterrestrial mapping is the mapping of areas and surfaces of places outside of Earth's atmosphere. Uh, extraterrestrial mapping occurs at several scales from asteroids to galaxies. So the question often comes out, why do we care about it? 
Well, there's three main reasons. There is the curiosity of the unknown, which, you know, we want to see what's out there. Uh, a huge driver in the exploration of extraterrestrial planets and bodies includes, you know, natural resources. It's a huge driver. I'm sure several people have heard of Elon Musk and the SpaceX program. And the other major reason is that if we do encounter intelligent life, we would like to map the civilizations that they have created and not wander accidentally into Klingon territory. So a few basic things about Venus. It is the second planet from the sun. It was named after the Roman god of love. Uh, it is slightly smaller than Earth, but not by much. It is Earth's sister planet. And it is the hottest planet in the solar system due to a combination of close proximity and greenhouse gases that are found on the planet. So there were several missions to Venus that really helped us understand the geology behind the planet. Missions began in 1961 by the Soviet Union. Uh, they were not able to take off until 1967 due to several errors. Uh, the first craft to actually land on the planet was on what occurred in 1970, making them the first country to land a spacecraft on another planet. In 1982, the Russians landed Venera 13 on Venus and sent back data back to Earth for roughly two hours before melting and succumbing to Venus's tours and terrors. The US conducted their own missions to Venus, including the Magellan Project, which helped to map the surface of Venus in the early 90s. And future exploration projects are being thought up of. And in 2029, the Russians are planning another mission to Venus to gather more data in their Venera D project. So the synthetic aperture radar is a type of radar that we use to map surfaces. Uh, this technology was used to map the surfaces of Venus with the Magellan project. So how this works is the higher elevated areas are lighter in color, while the lower elevated areas are darker. And a few things we want to know about mapping on Venus, uh, there is no such thing as West on Venus. Like West is an Earth thing. Uh, everything is in degrees East. The dark rectangular areas are unknown or missed areas of the radar technology. The total area that we're going to be looking at is about twice the size of Texas. So it's a pretty big area. And here is a photo of the SAR. So if you can see my mouse, you can see several different types of lineations, ridges and stuff. And of course, the large volcanoes in the southeast and southwest corners. We have another way of looking at the images of Venus, which includes the inverted SAR. So the inverted SAR works in the opposite way of the SAR in that the SAR looks at the deeper areas in dark, while the inverted SAR looks at the higher areas in dark. So here was the SAR image, and we can compare that with the inverted SAR image. And we do this to see different features that are on the inverted SAR that could have been missed by the actual SAR. So there's a few steps to creating an extraterrestrial map. Uh, the first step is to locate and map different units and features on the planet. The second step is to create a map key and describe them, also known as a domu or description of map units. And then the final step is to create a story slash summary of the map units or the SOMU, which is basically the history of the surface that we're looking at. And the overall goal of any geological map is to get a big picture of the region. So here was my first attempt of drawing the lineations. And I was able to come up with several that I was able to find. And then this area, what we see in the inverted SAR is the regions that are lighter and darker. I was able to draw lines around each of those regions. So when I initially presented this to my professor, she kind of got a little mad at me, but I'm so glad I saved this because it really helps to show where things are being seen before they're filled in. So this was the final filled in of the units and we can see the different relationships between them. And then 
So here is the final map that was eventually constructed of the region. Here is the map key briefly, as well as the description of map units. And we'll come back to this when we have the Q&A sessions. And then here is the map history. So the map history works the same way as like a strat column. So what a strat column does is that we have our youngest units at the top and our oldest units at the bottom. And we try to build a history. So this is our SOMU and, or like our story of what we're trying to look at. So I wanted to briefly touch on the future of extraterrestrial mapping. So something that everybody should know that I think you should really take away from this presentation is that all geological maps are wrong. Mine are wrong. People who work in professional industries are wrong. Like every single geological map is wrong. And that's okay because you can't map every single little feature that is on a map. The goal is to get a bigger picture of the region. Several things that I know that are wrong with my map include specific rock types because we have not been able to get a clear understanding of the rocks yet. Uh, economic deposits have not been mapped because we have not discovered any yet on Venus that I know of. And other geological features that have not been discovered yet obviously have not been presented on the map. However, something very exciting, many of these futures, our kids will probably be able to map those in the future someday. I hope that they'll be able to land on the planets and see what's going on. But for now, the technology is not available, but it is being developed. That brings us to the conclusion of my presentation. Do we have any questions? All right. Well, first of all, well, before we go, first, thank you, thank you, Matt. That was great. Round of applause. I, I know, I know, people are doing it over there. Um, yeah. So mapping extraterrestrial worlds. Um, let's check. So uh, there was a great question actually that, that just came in. Can we, can, we, can we go back to that map? Um, the inverted SAR images. Um, there yep. was something actually. We were uh, talking about this a little, uh, not too long ago. I think. Uh, yeah, that one right there. I think uh, this one or the... that. That's a great one. Okay. Um, uh, uh, P. Jackson asked, why are there only degrees east on Venus? So degrees east on seeing? Venus. So back when they first mapped the planet, our planet Earth, we had something called the prime meridian and that divided west and east from each other. And in modern times, I guess it was decided to just do it in degrees east because you could do a 360 uh, model of the surface and not, you know, have to worry about converting, converting it to west or do anything like that. So there is a north and a south, but degrees east is the only latitude that we see. That's the best that I can explain. And it, well, it makes sense. I mean, it would be easier uh, if you think we're going around on a, on a sphere, you, you can go either direction, but you can also just use that one directional there and not have to worry about negatives and going west and so on just just count it that way um there so there's been a lot you mentioned that uh little while there's been a lot of history of mapping venus um someone had asked um what uh where did i miss it uh what is an economic deposit um is this maybe something related to the future of venus or are we going to be um are we going to be mining this is, venus this is definitely a good question so this is potentially something that we will see in the future, you know, if we do mine on Venus, but especially with like asteroids right now. So an economic deposit is a mineral deposit that is economically and profitable to mine. So there are many other types of deposits that you wouldn't want to dig because you'd be losing money. So an economic deposit basically drills down to what are you mining? how much of the material is there and how easy is it to access. So that's what an economic deposit is. And so that would be like a, a scale then of like, is it, would that be an economic deposit would be just the type of thing and there might be ones that are less, well, profitable, I guess, and the ones that are yep. more profitable. So like less overall. rich, more rich. Uh, but yeah, I mean, a lower grade ore can be more valuable than a high grade ore by the amount of material. So if there's a huge, you know, 
low grade aura system and you have a very tiny high grade aura system, the low grade aura system is more valuable. So, you know, there's a lot that really goes into that. And that's probably like a whole semester long college class of how much you can talk about that. And yeah. Well, yeah. maybe we can answer just one really important question then. Um, when it comes to Venus, asteroids, you mentioned maybe space entirely. Uh, can this solve the supply chain issues we keep having? Is this the solution? It can. Uh, the space in itself is much more plentiful in natural resources than Earth. And it has been long argued that we should try to move our projects to space. Right now, the technology is growing. It's not completely there yet, but it is growing. Something interesting to note is that every element above 26 has to be has to originate in space or come from exploding stars or supernova. So every element above 26 has to originate in space. So all of the gold, platinum, copper, silver, all those elements had to have come from Earth via asteroids or meteorites and all that type of stuff. And for those who, who keep up on space news, um, the few years back, they found uh, the merger of neutron stars creates, as part of that merger, create that explosion then creates an abundance of gold, actually. So we, we get these elements produced in space, and then they're only here on Earth by virtue of this, of the impacts of, of a long history of everything going on. One of the coolest impacts that we study as economic geologists is the Sudbury Basin impact. And that impact did two things for us. So the first thing is when it landed, uh, all of the iron deposits in Minnesota stopped forming, like the day that iron formation hit. And the reason behind that is because the uh, stromatolites that were in the environment at the time ceased to exist. And that was one of the things that I always found very fascinating with the asteroid and economic deposits. The second thing that it did though too, is that it deposited one of the largest copper, nickel and platinum group element deposits in the world. So that was mined for hundreds and hundreds of years. So yeah, I mean, asteroid geology is very fascinating. So even without knowing it, we've, we've space has already had an economic impact on us and it's yes. literal impact, I guess, good choice of words. Um, going back to, so to your last, um, I think it was roughly your last slide there. Um, and to our folks behind the scenes, don't get rid of all those questions for me, please, because I-, I This slide or was it there? Um, yes, so the uh, the first bullet point, because uh, D. Uh, Manaset, um, apologies if I get your name wrong, uh, more got your name wrong, it asks, isn't it, is it more that the information just isn't collected versus being wrong? Um, and they know they've learned more about Venus Day than they ever knew before. So congratulations. So yeah. when, when it's wrong, when we say geological maps are wrong, is that, is that, or is that a fundamental thing? Like, yes, they're just, they're just totally wrong or have we just not studied it enough? So that is a good question. I mean, when you go back to like, oh, it's not going. Oh, there we go. Okay, so when we go back to an area like this, this is, you know, once again, this twice the size of Texas, right? The area is. And when you have an area about the tw twice the size of Texas, you could map your entire life and not find every little detail about it. So it is a fundamental thing that you will always be wrong, but it's also that we haven't studied enough too. So that question is really, really good in that it's a two-way street. So the answer to it is yes. So both things are true about the question. And yeah, I mean, I remember one of my field camp map mappers from this past summer. So I did my other half this past summer. He always told us, yep, every single geological map is wrong. And he works for the NRI and was a huge impact on my life. So yeah. Well, speaking of, speaking of huge impacts, this is a great word tonight, impacts. Um, <laughs> had a, I think a couple, you've mentioned this a couple of times, you have different people in your past, um, but Joe is wondering, have you always liked space? Yes, I've always found it fascinating. So, you know, initially I thought maybe I'll go into space, but then I fell in love with geology and space kind of just came right back to my doorstep and be like, 
hey, look, you can do geology in space. And yeah, so I've always loved it. And now that it's tying into the classes that I've had, it's been amazing. So yeah, so uh, for, for Joe out there who asked that, um, if you love space right now, um, there's something for you there. For anyone who maybe is just learning about today, there's definitely something for you there. Um, let's do a bit of, we have a, a couple more minutes here, but uh, let's do a lightning round of questions. I'm gonna give you like five seconds to answer each of these questions. You ready for this? Okay. Okay, you sound very confident. Um, why does Venus rotate backwards from, from HOFM? That is something I do not know. That'd probably be a Vicky question, but with the rotation being backwards, I think that's just probably how, you know, initially when the solar system was created, some planets mass rotated one way and some rotated another because each of the planetary bodies in our solar system formed roughly at the same time. Yep. <laughs> great. No, great. That was great. So going back to the formation of the solar system, that was great. Um, I'm putting you on the spot here. I love it. Uh, hopefully you do too. Oh, this is going to be hard in five seconds. Uh, let's see, because we were talking about this before. Uh, Mike is wondering, is there any evidence of plate tectonics on Venus? The question to that is, we don't know. <laughs> it is being debated uh, fiercely. If you ever want to see scientists get really, really mad at each other, go to a professional conference and they will argue with each other to death. It is quite interesting. But <laughs> yes. Uh, we do not know. Uh, we are still currently studying that. Okay. All right. Great. That is a great answer. I mean, going back to that thing about what, you know, what don't we know? There's so much we have yet to study. Um, uh, Yoko is asking, is the sun's core hotter than the surface of Venus? Noting they are eight years old. One of our young, young scientists out there, is the sun's core hotter than the surface of Venus? The answer to that is yes. And because of the fusion reaction that's going on, and you'll learn more about this when you get into higher levels of science, is that because of the nuclear reaction that's going on in the sun's core, it's hotter there than it is on the surface of Venus. All right, so very different conditions. Sun's core about 25 million, if I'm drawing on some of my solar knowledge I, that I should remember from my head, 25 million. And what was the temperature on Venus again? Somewhere around 870 degrees Celsius, I think, or Fahrenheit. That's probably Fahrenheit. So, so pretty warm. You know, yeah, it, pretty, pretty nice warm. and toasty. Enough to bake cookies in for sure. Probably for Oh, nice. Them. Yeah. So while you're mining there, you can have a snack. Um, oh, yeah. Have uh, uh, Zebert's, I am apologize again for these na uh, name, getting names wrong. Uh, quick five seconds of what minerals are found on Venus? So still under study, but the theory right now is a deep mantle mineral called post-perovskite. And we have never seen that mineral before. Uh, it is theorized that that is a good chunk of the deep mantle here on Earth. And we believe that that's mostly the mineral that's made up on Venus right now. So po post perovskite Post-perovskite, yes. post perovskite See, yeah, I can't do, I, I can't, apparently I can't pronounce words tonight. <laughs> Um, it's okay. That's a mouthful. <laughs> um, we are just seeing perovskite for the first time. We have not seen post perovskite yet. And <laughs> hopefully someday we do, but that would be a very hard thing to see. So, so, so peroxide then was like the original post, then uh, maybe like post rock, which uh, leads me to a question we had a little earlier. Um, if Mars, or in this case, if Venus rocks were rock, uh, music bands or artists, uh, what would they be? What music would you choose for Venus? Oh, that's a tough one. I'd go with We Will Rock You, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's a that is a classic. A um, couple more questions we've had before. Uh, we've, we've sort of answered them. We'll take another answer at them. I think it's going to be the same answer, but let us know. Um, a couple people are wondering, uh, any signs of aliens out there? So... Funny you should ask that Venus right now, we are looking at a phosphine layer in the atmosphere that might have some microbial life. It's still very much under study and we are still definitely keeping an eye on it, but the, the layer was just recently identified. So there's still just a ton to learn about it. All right, so that is a great question. Um, 
there, there are a few more. There, there have been so many great questions. Um, I, I'm going to take over the screen share for a minute. As we do that, though, uh, Matt, are you, are you free to stick around to help answer some of the questions in the yep, Q&A? Absolutely. There? All right, and you should check out the chat. We've got a great few, few, few people out there. Thank you, Matt. If you want to thank Matt, throw that in the chat there. Um, and a round of applause uh, on this side and on the, I know on the other side. Uh, thank you for a great presentation there. Thank you very much for having me. All right. And you are great. I should say too, uh, class of 22, right? You're coming up on graduation. Yep. Looking um, good. Seems... Yep. Looking very good. All right. Excellent. Um, then we will keep an eye on that. Uh, keep an eye on, on, on your future endeavors. Okay. Um, so a uh, th huge thank you, Matt. Um, for those, uh, there are a few questions left there in the, the Q&A. Um, Matt, I think it would be able to time to stick around. He was just saying to, to answer those. Um, they are great questions. I'm going to keep an eye on the answered ones because I'm curious about those answers myself. Um, I want to jump back to um, our uh, my screen uh, here in just a second. Um, that was our talk by Matt. Um, we had... Uh, we had some great questions. Um, yes, gifts are coming back throughout this. And yes, they are pronounced gifts. Um, coming back to our star map though, a few things to look for in the sky tonight. Um, again, with our star map here, and don't worry, I'm remembering that annotation. Um, we have, uh, there are three things I wanna point out tonight that, um, that you can see. Um, and they're going to go sort of in order of, of, uh, of difficulty, not too difficult, don't worry. Uh, we're going to start off with a very easy thing. Um, it's an object, a beautiful deep sky object called M42 or Messier 42. To find this object in the sky, you're going to look for the constellation of Orion. I just, I talked a whole lot about Orion just a short while ago. We always come back to him. Orion is visible right now in the sky, if it's clear, and here uh, through the month of February to the south, southeast, um, depending, of course, on the time of night. But here in the early evening, six, seven, eight-ish o'clock, looked south, southeast. Look for, in particular, his three belt stars. Take a stab at circling them there, right there. Uh, those three belt stars, very easy to see. Um, again, looking here, sorry, I should have done that before, looking to the southeast. Um, again, to use your star map to do this, um, you're going to hold the star map up, um, load the images all in front of you, looking right at it. You're going to face to somewhere to the southeast, or you're going to look for Orion, and you're going to move the map so that it is roughly in the direction you're looking. So if you're looking in the southeast, you'd hold it, and you'd want to turn that map a little bit to match the sky in front of you. Um, and again, this part down at the lower, oops, the lower side there, my annotation apparently wanted to stop working. Um, this would be where the horizon is. Um, and to find M42, uh, looking again at the belt of Orion, well, just look a little bit below it. M42 is a little fuzzy patch right below the belt of Orion. Um, it is visible in part of what we call the sword of Orion hanging off his belt. And you can see this little patch, this little fuzzy patch in the sky, um, even from here inside the Twin Cities. I saw it with, with difficulty. Um, I saw it a few nights ago when I was out sledding uh, over in Minneapolis. Um, if you happen to have a small telescope or a pair of binoculars, um, it is a beautiful sight to look at. Uh, this is an image from uh, an, an astro, uh, astro photograph from Jerry uh, Lodgrass, um, showing roughly, in fact, uh, what that would look like. Um, I, I spent a while looking for images that gave us a good idea, that might give you a good idea of it, that matched what I've seen, especially as the best point of comparison that I have. Um, and that's a, that's a beautiful view through, again, good pair of binoculars, uh, 10 by 60s, 10 by 70s or something. Um, and, or if you have a small telescope. Um, this nebula is a, is a star forming region. So where new stars are being born, even as we speak. Um, this has been imaged in incredible detail by great telescopes, especially the greatest telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, showing in detail the beautiful wisps and whirls and clouds of gas, mostly hydrogen gas, that fill up this nebula here, um, as well as the countless thousands of stars all within it. Um, it's, it's an incredible sight um, and easy to find, easy to see, um, easy to think about the scope of history here. 
Um, these stars being born may have been born a few tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, even a few millions of years ago. Um, and there'll be more stars born over the next few tens of hundreds of thousands, millions of years. Um, looking back uh, at our sky, I want to uh, actually check uh, if we have any questions, perfectly legitimate or not. Um, got one in particular I'll take a stab at here um, from Phil. Um, oh, asking actually, oh, I'm sorry, Phil, Phil. Matt, actually, if you're still there, I'm going to ask you to answer that one in the Q&A. I hope you can. Um, will James Webb help with mapping, especially mapping of other worlds? Um, we're going to try to answer that one there. Um, I'll give my basic answer here from what I know of the work James Webb is doing um, is that it will hopefully be taking a look at some planets um, in our solar system, but a large part of it is also looking outwards um, and hopefully mapping and getting a good idea of the atmospheres of exoplanets. All right, uh, Stern though asking, what is the best time to see a shooting star? Um, well, any time is really great. Um, if you head outside pretty much any night, you can look up and you might see just every so often a bright flash of light. Um, that will be a star or a piece of rock or dust um, heating up the atmosphere around it, burning up as, as we say commonly, um, and that is a shooting star. Um, there are of course better times of the year to see that, especially during meteor showers. So when we have, when the earth is traveling through a, the path of a comet, um, going through the dust and gas left behind by a comet, um, that's when we end up with great meteor showers. Uh, I'm going to have to check on what meteor showers are coming up. I don't know of any big ones happening in the next month or so, um, but maybe one of our uh, cohorts behind the scene, Darcy or Hannah, maybe you can take a, uh, take a stab at checking on, on any great meteor showers coming up and putting that in the chat so I can, I can know as well. All right. Um, Back to our sky here, uh, we're going to travel a little bit downwards from Orion, but still the same part of the sky itself. So Orion is over here, still looking to the southeast and looking now above the back of Canis Major. Now this next object here, uh, I made a little blue square for it. Actually, ended up, it, I ended up not putting on this particular map, but you all can mark it out on your own where you are. Um, right off the back of the dog, or the back of Canis Major, who, which is dominated by the bright star Sirius right there, an easy star to remember. Sirius there is named after the character from Harry Potter. Um, so you can easily recognize it there in the sky. Right off the back of the dog is a beautiful open cluster of stars known as Tau Canis Majoris. It is one of my absolute favorite clusters of star, stars in the entire sky. Um, and a great one to look at because again, easy to find right off the back of the dog and easy to see with binoculars or if you've got a telescope. It's also a great sort of standard for, for open clusters. It gives you a good idea of what you might expect to see with other ones. Uh, it's a young group of stars, just about four, maybe five million years old. So baby stars overall. Um, it's got one very bright one near what we see as the center of the cluster. Um, that would be Tau Canis Majoris itself, the star that gives the cluster its, its name. But surrounding it, all of these other stars, I won't even try to circle them all, these are all stars that are part of this group. So we have here several hundred stars that are all closely bound together. They were born probably in, they were born in the same nebula, maybe probably not the Orion Nebula, but a different, not a different stellar nursery. And they're moving through the galaxy together. Um, so these stars are sticking together um, as, as stars do in the first parts of their lives. Um, open clusters are very common across the sky, especially within the Milky Way, uh, within the main disk of the Milky Way galaxy. So if we go backwards a bit here, um, we haven't picked out every single open cluster in the sky because there's a lot of them. But looking all along the gray band across the sky, running from the southeast to the northwest, that's our Milky Way. And you can see a good number of clusters, like there's a double cluster over there, uh, M38 and 36 as well marked out, and the one you may be most familiar with, the Seven Sisters or the Pleiades. Um, these, oh, and I did I miss C10, Caldwell 10 up there, another open one. Um, all of these are great examples of bright, fairly young, easy to find groups of stars in the sky. 
And uh, they all have their own differences though, from the Pleiades, which has some beautiful nebulosity around it, uh, to 38 and 36, which look like they might be companions, but are actually not, to the double cluster, which actually probably are companion groups. Um, so you can spend a lot of time with open clusters, as, as simple as they are, these groups of stars, um, they are, uh, they have a lot going on uh, with them. Um, another image here of, of the Tau Canis Majoris cluster, um, giving, a, again, a view of what you might see if you've got a pair of backyard binoculars or a telescope. Um, coming along, uh, one more gift for y'all there. Uh, wanted to pause, uh, just see what else is there. Oh, uh, and I'm sorry, Mary, I, I think I've missed this one. This is a little while ago. Uh, asking geology is for Earth. So the study of rocks, uh, minerals, uh, excuse me, on Earth is geology. When we study in Mars, it's areology. What is the name for Venus? Matt, are you still there? Matt, can you answer this one? Um, if you want to pop on your mic for a minute there, do you know this one? It would be something latin -ier, uh Greek-y, wouldn't it? Uh, Venus, um, it would be Aphrodite, right? Um, so how I would answer that one would be a general term that we use now is sort of like just geology or, you know, areology. For extraterrestrial geology, we just call it astrogeology, for like the, bro the broad scope of things. I'm sure there's probably a very specific term for the geology on Venus, but off the top of my head, I don't know that. So. Which, but I mean, I think astrogeology then, right? Astrogeology? <laughs> That makes sense. There's a lot there. If we had to come up with a name for every single object, then it's going to get a little, uh, yeah, a little much. Yep. Uh, Pluto, Plutoology, Sharonology. Um, there's a few million asteroids, so it might get a little. That might be a bit of work there. Mm -hmm. All right. So astrogeology, um, and then I'll see uh, Megan, Megan or Megan Frank is asking, can we see the Northern Lights from the museum, or how far how far north of Minneapolis do we have to go? I will confidently say, no, we cannot see the Northern Lights from the museum, from the Bell Museum. Um, I would not expect them to see, to see them within the Twin Cities unless there was some really extensive uh, geomagnetic storm uh, from the sun. Um, I, would, I would not really expect to see that anytime soon, as it were. If you do want to see them, I would travel at least an hour north of the Twin Cities. That would be where I'd just start to go. Um, because you want to really get away from the city lights. That's the key. Um, that would be sort of the bare minimum. I, I would even hazard a guess and say even further headed out to the, if you can, the boundary waters, that would be the place that I would personally go. Um, that is, a, of course, a bit of a trip um, with, with all the complications in there. Um, Jordan's saying, though, that he saw some from the south suburbs in 2016. Uh, that's impressive. Um, that's amazing. I, I don't, there must have been, a, there must have been some eruption from the sun that caused that. Um, our northern lights are caused um, from, uh, from energy from the sun hitting our atmosphere, causing the air to glow. Um, so there must have been some, a massive solar flare. Um, and then Mike popping and saying, thinking the best term for planets and satellites is, is planetary geology then, if you are uh, sticking with just planets. Uh, moonology, I think maybe then, moonology would be for best for moons. Um, all right, one more question I'll answer while we're right here. Uh, from Bonnie, what is in the photos of the star clusters, why is there a circular glow around them? Ooh, going the wrong direction there. Um, so in both of these, yeah, the circular glow that we're seeing here, um, without getting knowing the exact specifics, um, since I, I will, I did not take these images myself. I should, should have said that. Um, the circular glow is most is one hand. It could be the uh, the stars themselves actually overloading the sensors there. Um, so the starlight there just essentially in a way too bright for the sensors, um, and to trying to capture them all, we end up with that excess glow. And that especially as I look here um, from my not my amateur astrophotography expertise, I'm sort of seeing a circular ring, which says to me, star glow there coming out around it. Um, looking at this other one here, um, I would hazard guess the exact same reason though. Um, very bright stars that we're seeing um, from here and here and, and here. Um, and of course the very central star in the region there um, all of that maybe kept just overloading sensors. 
However, I would encourage you to look up the, the credits are here for both of these. Um, one here from, uh, from Ray Caro, uh, who uploaded Astrobin. Um, so check out his work. Um, and then also from uh, the Mount Lemmon Sky Center at U of A from, from Adam Block. Um, there are different filters that astronomers use to study the sky um, that show us different things. Uh, they can bring out different details, especially. All right, we've got one more presenter coming up. I wanna point out one final thing in the sky um, because uh, I can. We, uh, I do wanna direct your attention over to the Northeast over here. Uh, the Northeast is where we find our Big Dipper. Can't miss it in the sky. Um, you may also find it by looking pretty much directly North. Right now, this time of year, the Big Dipper is standing pretty much straight up and down um, with the handle pointed down and the bucket high up in the sky. If you look above the handle or see the bucket of the dipper, there's a cluster, a group of two objects here, not a cluster, known as M81 and M82. I'll direct your attention in particular to M81, also known as Bode's Nebula or Bode's Galaxy. Uh, just one of my absolute favorite galaxies in the entire sky. I've, I've gotten a chance to observe it many times. Um, it is a fairly close galaxy within about 50 million light years to us in the local neighborhood. Um, and it is a faint, it is a spiral galaxy. We can start to see here in these images that match roughly what you would see in binoculars again, or in this case, a pretty good telescope on the right. Um, we can start to see a elongated structure here. In the telescopic view, we can see those spiral arms faintly wrapping around. Um, because it is so fairly close to us, um, it makes a very easy target for amateur astronomers, a very easy object to look for. Um, it is also very bright in part because there's a lot of star formation happening in, these two, in this galaxy because it does have a companion up over here is M82, also known as the Cigar Galaxy, um, because it's got that elongated shape, it kind of looks like a cigar. Um, these two galaxies are interacting and their gravitational pull and push and pull on each of them is causing stars, new stars to be born. Going all the way back then to the Orion Nebula, that Orion Nebula is where stars are starting here in our own galaxy. There are thousands of nebulas just like it in these two galaxies here, M81 and M82. Um, if you have your hands on the Hubble, or eyes on the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, this is more of what you might see here. Uh, if you do ha happen to get time on the Hubble Space Telescope, please let me know. I'd, uh, I'd love to talk to you about that. Um, great question there as we see it. Um, why is it in a swirl? Clarissa are asking, why is it in a swirl? Why and why do stars and galaxies have companions? Um, great question. We see this swirl shape here, this disk shape, because as the galaxy formed, the stars forming within it, coming together, they had their own momentum. They were moving around their own direction, but there was sort of an overall 51% motion of the stars. And as they moved around, um, that motion won out um, and it settled down in the spiral shape. That's true for spiral galaxies. It's not true for every galaxy though. There's some very different types of galaxies. Um, and they've got companions like M81 and A2 have, have, have uh, companion galaxies here, or they are companions, stars are companions because of gravity and also the sheer number of objects like this. There are approximately 200 billion stars in our Milky Way. There are approximately 2 trillion galaxies in the universe, a very approximate number. And because of this, we see a lot of them because of their mutual, their gravitational pull, they've, they've, stuck together in some way. Um, in this case, usually loosely bound together, um, but we do find large clusters of galaxies, um, all dominated by, gal uh, by, by, by gravity. Great question. Um, and for more great questions, but especially great talks, we're finally getting a little late in the day here, but uh, Sunat, you have stuck around, I am sure, right? You're back there somewhere? Absolutely. All right. Excellent. If you want to take it away, a um, little bit more about geology coming home to Mars. What have you got to tell us about our beautiful red neighbor? Great. So I'll go ahead and get started. But first, I want to say thanks to Matt. I, I really enjoyed learning about the mapping on Venus. We'll see a little bit of see a little bit of mapping on Mars, but I didn't get to do it myself. I'm just taking images off the Internet. 
And so today I'm just going to be talking about a little bit of uh, what we've been learning about Martian geology, as well as the, the research that I'm doing to further understand uh, Martian geology. And so just a little, let's see, just a little background about me. I would consider myself, so earlier there was a debate about what type of label you would give for someone that studies planets. I would consider myself partially a planetary geologist, so someone that studies the geology of celestial bodies, including planets and moons and asteroids and comets and meteorites. But I, I'm more trained as an igneous petrologist, so I'm, I focus mostly on igneous rocks or rocks that are formed from uh, lava or magma. And so combining those two, the place where I want to study or the place that I, I am really interested in uh, is the mantle of Mars or of any planet. And so I think mantles are really neat. Uh, why? Well, they're usually the biggest part of most planets. Uh, it's in between the core and crusts of all the terrestrial rocky planets. Uh, and they take up the most space. They host the most elements. And they also contribute elements to the crust. And they also uh, contribute elements to the atmosphere via volcanism. And so as an igneous petrologist, I'm interested in how volcanoes can create rocks and what those rocks can tell us about the interior of the planet. And uh, as you can see in this little diagram to the left, uh, the mantle's composition will play a huge role in the formation and the development of a planetary atmosphere. And so I would argue that the composition of a planet's mantle uh, plays a huge role in determining whether or not a planet is habitable or not. Um, okay, well, the tough thing about studying the Martian mantle is we have no samples of Mars mantle. We, uh, so how can we figure out what the composition of the mantle is, what the chemistry of uh, what's, going down, what's going on in Mars? Um, and so before I get to how we can get there, I'll just talk about a brief history of the exploration of Mars in general. And so Mars's existence has been uh, studied by humans for over 4,000 years. And uh, this is one of the earliest uh, attempts of mapping the Martian surface. So this is a, this is a sketch made by Christian Huygen in 1659 of the volcanic plain of uh, Sirtis Major. Uh, and this is uh, an image of Mars from uh, everyone's favorite Hubble telescope. Uh, as we can see, we have a lot more resolution. We can see a lot more features on the surface uh, compared to what Christian saw. And uh, also looking at the mapping work that uh, Matt was showing us, we have a lot better understanding of what the surface looks like. Few other facts about Mars: We know that it's the fourth planet uh, uh, away from the sun, so it's squished between the Earth and Jupiter. It has two mo two moons known as Phobos and Deimos. It has uh, the red color; we call it the red planet, which just comes from oxidized iron in the soil. The same stuff that makes uh, rust red and orange. And currently, Mars has a really thin atmosphere and uh, no liquid uh, no liquid water. And so it's currently uninhabitable, meaning that there's no life, there's no plants, there's no animals, no humans there uh, yet, or there might have been in the past. But these uh, conclusions have been figured out well before we had the opportunity to actually uh, pursue space travel in the 1950s. Uh, and so, uh, so what, what is the motivation for space travel? Uh, well, a big part of the motivation is to understand Martian geology. And so on this top right image, we have the Curiosity rover taking a selfie at a geologic feature called as Mount Marku. Um, and we can see there's a lot of rocks. There's a lot of like ripple structures in the rocks. Uh, in the bottom figure, we have uh, uh, Mariner Valley, which is a valley which is even greater than, uh, which is larger than the Grand Canyon by multiple times. And so just to remind us, geology is the study of all the interior and exterior processes that have shaped and continue to shape a planet. And if we observe rocks and other geologic features, as well as observing geologic events such as uh, volcanic eruptions or uh, earthquakes, we can learn about the interior of planets and especially about the interior of Mars. 
and how it's formed and evolved over time. And so a lot of the spacecraft missions have been focused on uh, investigating the geology of Mars, as well as uh, looking at uh, conditions of habitability on Mars, whether it's, it has been habitable in the past or if it would be able to become habitable in the future. And so this is a geologic map, like uh, similar to what Matt showed. This is kind of like a compiled uh, geologic map and uh, Matt gave a pretty good intro on how to read it. Uh, for us, we see that each color corresponds to a different rock type. And uh, we can see that there's a lot of different rock types on the surface of Mars. Uh, Mars also does not have any plate tectonics. And there's a lot of valleys formed from early water and ice, although the water and I, uh, there's not much flowing water on the planet right now. And it's heavily cratered. And uh, one thing we can tell, uh, one way we can identify the craters on this geologic map are these like circular features. Uh, you can imagine the center of the circular feature is going to be like the bottom of the crater. And you can see the oldest rock all the way at the bottom. And then as you go further out, side of the sensor, you can see younger and younger rock. And so, uh, so that's all we've learned about the surface, but how do we learn about the interior? So before we had uh, too much data, we, uh, or before we got to the point where we are today, we would guess about the interior structure based on uh, the chemistry of planets in general, we would we assumed what uh, chemistry Mars had, and we would try and, based on the mass of the planet, try and distribute the elements between the core, mantle, and the crust. But as of a couple of years ago, we put this guy on the moon. So this is InSight, uh, which is an interior exploration using seismic investigations, geodesy, and heat transport lander. Note. Uh, NASA really loves acronyms, even if they don't like actually work, because I don't know where this E goes in InSight. But um, what InSight does is it listens to Mars quakes to figure out how sound travels through the Mars uh, through Mars's crust, uh, mantle, and core. And so the same way that Earth has earthquakes, Mars has Mars quakes, and by uh, inverting the like the the seismic profiles. We can get an understanding of the uh, the interior structure of Mars. And so this is uh, published in a paper pretty recently by Stoller et al., where you can uh, where we've delineated the boundaries of the core and the mantle of uh, Mars. So, but at this point, we have all this data. But how, do we have any rocks? So. We haven't collected any rocks on the surface. There is a mission uh, right now to bring back rocks from the Martian surface in 2030, but the only physical samples that we have right now are from uh, Martian meteorites. And so meteorites, they, uh, meteorites come from uh, high energy impacts onto Mars's surface, which eject Mars rocks into space. They'll travel around in space and some of them may fall onto another planet Sometimes they fall onto Earth, and then they can be studied by people like me uh, that, is, that are more interested in the geochemistry of Martian rocks. And so going back to my initial motivation, I'm interested in planetary mantles. So how can I use Martian meteorites or just Martian rock compositions to study the Martian mantle? Uh, well, if I can look at igneous rocks from Mars, I can... Uh, figure out the conditions of the mantle where uh, the igneous rock was formed. And so I'm in the experimental petrology lab at University of Minnesota. So uh, petrology is a study of rocks. Experimental petrology means that we make our own rocks uh, in high temperature furnaces. And so to start, we take uh, a little platinum loop, and this is a very small, uh, small loop uh, there's an air pod for scale. Uh, we load that loop with uh, crushed up rock powder that's mixed in with an alcohol glue. And that can, uh, we can load the loop. And so this loop is loaded with a, uh, a rock composition, specifically a basalt that's known as Humphrey. 
uh, and we then put it into a furnace. So this is a Deltec DT31 gas mixing vertical furnace, or as we like to call them, Tito. Uh, we, Tito is a really helpful tool because uh, we can control temperatures to very high precision and we can flux in uh, different gases to, uh, to modulate the chemistry inside uh, the furnace. And so for example, I will uh, take Humphrey and put him into Tito, melt him at 1400 Celsius and change the chemistry by fluxing in uh, carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide and oxygen. Uh, and then once it's melted and it's had some time for the chemistry to all equilibrate or become happy where it is, then I cool it down really fast. And so whenever you cool down magma or lava really fast or molten rock really fast, it turns into glass. Um, this glass can then be uh, broken up and analyzed with a lot of different uh, microanalytical techniques. And so just show you that I took a little chip of uh, one of my experiments and I polished it and I measured the chemistry with a technique called electron microprobe analyses. Basically each one of these red circles indicates a dot where I put a beam of electrons and based on the radiation that comes out, we can assign, uh, we can uh, measure the chemistry of a given rock. And so this chemistry, for example, oh, this rock has like 47% silicon, 0.49% titanium, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a lot of different other chemical analyses if you're trying to investigate uh, specific elements. Uh, for example, I'm really interested in the distribution of iron uh, in Martian rocks and how what it tells us about um, the conditions of the Martian mantle. And yeah. And so right now, the, the composition and the conditions of the Martian mantle is poorly understood and the, because we don't have any pieces of it. But if we carefully analyze Martian rocks and structures and geologic events, we can understand the whole planet better. And then if we couple that with geochemical studies that we do in our own labs here on Earth, as well as modeling of geologic processes, we can hypothesize whatever uh, processes that formed and evolved Mars. And so we can further science and get to know our neighboring red planet a lot better. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Tad, for hosting this. It's been really cool seeing this event, and I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. All right, awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, round of applause. Uh, that, can't do it with a pen in my hand, better without it. Um, that, that was great. Uh, this is incredible. Uh, I mean, you, we, you're working on understanding a part of Mars then that we, we literally can't see from space, right? Mantle's under the surface. Um, we don't have any samples of it, right? We need to, this, I mean, I, I find this incredible as I find everything. But I find this very incredible. We, uh, we're doing it all for the most part, right? We're doing it all with, um, with remote sensing of what's there and then having to match that up with, with a lot of, exper of experimentation right here on earth. Um, uh, how do you, I mean, at the end of the day, are you just exhausted by this? Uh, how do you, how yeah, do you relax? I mean, how do you, what, yeah. oh boy. <laughs> This sounds like it's, so it's much to me. <laughs> it's definitely a big puzzle. Like uh, just figuring out the composition of the crust is very difficult. I mean, remote sensing is only so reliable, but when we do remote sensing on Earth, you have a ground truth to, to base it off of. And it's tougher on Mars where you can't necessarily have a ground truth, except now with rovers, uh, we have little guys going around measuring the chemistry, uh, making it a bit better. And one thing that really struck me when I started studying Mars is I feel like most of what we understand from uh, like understanding Martian processes actually come from the Martian meteorites themselves. Um, and kind of just what we measure on the surface, at least in a geochemical perspective, is just kind of the icing on the top. Uh, but yeah, it's... It's a fun puzzle. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things that are unexplored. 
uh, one thing I really enjoy about being a planetary geologist is uh, you kind of have to learn a little bit about everything about the planet. Cause I know I have like friends uh, that study like earth geology and they'll focus on like one region or like one volcanic eruption. Cause there's so much information in that, but we're learning so much from Mars, like as each day passes and I'm kind of forced to be up to date with it. And I'm probably still very behind, but it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Well, maybe then, uh, you know, speaking of Martian meteorites, um, I remember back uh, now a few years ago now, there was, there was a bit of a uh, kerfuffle um, regarding one of the meteorites, uh, discovered, I think it was Allen Hills maybe, um, and some, some traces they found within it, something that looked like maybe it might've been, yeah, uh, the might've been caused by, by life. Because we've yeah. got a few questions here. Um, is there life on Mars? And especially another question there, was there ever life in the past? Have we, have we found signs of life? Are we, where do we stand on that when it comes to Mars? So when it comes to Mars, we definitely have seen that there has been flowing water on the surface. Um, one of the reasons why Mars, well, why people will say Mars is uninhabitable right now is because the atmosphere is really thin. And a lot of people attribute to that to the stripping of the planet's magnetosphere. But um, there's definitely very magnetized parts in the Martian crust, suggesting that there was a stronger magnetosphere, which would have suggested that there is more of uh, an atmosphere. Uh, about Allen Hills 84001. So uh, I think back in, it might've been in the late nineties where people started paying attention to this. So this is a meteorite that was for, uh, found in Antarctica. Um, and there were small features that people attributed to microfossils. Uh, I, I don't know what exact uh, organisms created them, but uh, people believe that, that those had very biotic origins. And people, uh, I think the original two scientists that published that the traces of life were found on Allen Hills 84001, they'll still de uh, defend it. But I think the, the general Martian petrology community has kind of uh, shifted away from it. I shared a link with someone who asked a question uh, about a pretty recent paper published in Science that attributed these uh, the the microfossils to uh, what what we call a serpentinization reactions, which I'm not super familiar with, but it's it's definitely uh, I I tend to believe that it's more abiotic, but I think the question of whether or not there was life on Mars is still uh, up in the air just because of the the possibility of it having a strong magnetosphere and having a thick atmosphere and having uh running uh or like flowing water but no evidence in my view there's no evidence uh that there was any life on, uh, in the past okay so we don't get to break the news today that that we've redefined the meaning of our place in the universe i guess that's, that's <laughs> why i mean fine it's a friday night i guess um, but speaking of so magnetic, so magnetic fields help. The magnetic fields they protect the Earth. Um, they uh, they cause the beautiful aurora. Um, that a few more people have put in the chat. I will say if if anyone wondering about that, um, Chuck, I won't give away your age either. Um, but apparently we saw them northern lights in the Twin Cities back in the fifties. Uh, but it, they help uh, with water. I'm scrolling through the questions. There were a ton of questions, by the way, here. Um, I, I noticed a, at least one or two. Uh, so all the water on Mars is frozen. There's no flowing water there right now because we know water is essential for life or from what we understand. Um, yeah. No liquid water. Yeah, that, uh, that's that's the current state of it right now. I, I saw, uh, actually, I think I have the, yeah, I have the link on it, of it in the chat. So mars.nasa.gov. I'll just kind of give you like a weather report of Mars right now. And apparently the high temperature is minus four Fahrenheit, which is like, just slightly colder than it is right here, but sure. uh, the low is like minus 98, which is really. <laughs> uh, so I uh, given the chance then, would you rather spend your winters in Minnesota or Mars? Oh. With, I will say, you know, with water, with food, you know, the other stuff, and you can just, we can just throw you there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, oh man, I would really love to experience low gravity for, 
significant amount of time. I think that I would brace the cold for that, for sure. <laughs> you need a new Olympic long jumper. You would, you would, yeah, hundred degrees. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and then, so uh, while you're there, it might be a little the round. The ground might be moving a little bit, but um, we had there are multiple questions here. Um, you know, Meg is asking. Um, they so they'd ask about is it do uh, Mars quakes? Uh, is that tectonic activity or meteorites? But then it seems like we don't have tectonic plates on Mars. What can we talk more about? Like what what's causing those Mars quakes? And we re, go over that again, really. Yeah, I can I can I can clear that up a little bit. So there's no plate tectonics on Mars, um, but there's and so I apologize for using. If there's other geologists in the chat, they'll probably recognize that this is this is an Earth uh, mantle, and Mars Mars's mantle is going to look a little bit different. But the the thing that drives plate tectonics is convection. Uh, so heat dissipating from the core, causing uh, like a swirling motion in the subsurface. And the difference between Earth and Mars is Earth, there's plate tectonics where the upper plate is broken up and part of it is, subduction, is subducting, part of it is spreading. Um, Mars has a stagnant lid, but the convection in the subsurface is still uh, undergoing. So in the solid mantle, there's still rocks slipping over each other and uh, the the release of stress of rocks strip, slipping over each other still cause uh, still cause like earthquake uh, type tremors and so Mars quakes uh, although they aren't related to plate tectonics they are related to tectonic activity and convection activity in the mantle so similar type processes, but we're dealing with a very different world. Is that um, the differences there than we're seeing? Um, Mars is cooled down a lot more, um, but then we, you know, you were showing that the composition of the rocks, um, and you know what, what, what we know it's made of too. Um, and and Mike had asked uh, about different types of rock: basalt, diorite, uh, diorite, granitoid rocks. Um, I should not be trying to pronounce things tonight, apparently. Uh, is there a very different composition of Mars? Does that lead to some of the differences or is it internal heat? Is there, is it a simpler thing? So in the, the realm of plate tectonics, I think the general consensus is um, from planet formation time. So when everything was molten and started to cool down because there's not as much retained heat in a smaller planet, uh, you're not gonna get like cracking at the surface creating like the, the plate tectonics or like the, the fractured plates uh, at the top. Um, there is, there are slight compositional differences between, uh, between the planets. So if I were to show, yeah. So the rocky planets, so Mercury, Venus, Mar uh, Earth and Mars, uh, they're all slightly different just because they created different distances away from the sun. Uh, that changes their chemical composition, especially like the, the big thing that people will look at is the iron to silicon ratio. Um, Mars has a little bit more iron, although that the, the extent of that is, uh, is debated. But I don't, I don't think the, the difference in tectonic styles uh, isn't really compositionally, uh, compositionally dependent. At least I don't think so. Okay. Um, and actually looking at those pictures, I think we had a question early on. Uh, maybe go back one slide. I think it was right at the beginning here. One of these first beautiful images. I, I mentioned earlier how much I love the, the Huygens drawings. Um, I love I love look, the first drawings of, of, of anything from Saturn to Mars, Jupiter. Um, I, what we were able to see hundreds of years ago, it astonishes me. Um, but I think Clarissa, Cal Clarissa was asking about the, I think asking about the image on the right because they're asking how, how come part of it's blue? I think we're seeing some blue, maybe you draw on it, I think, but near the top of Mars, maybe around the edges there. Um, can you tell a little bit the different different colors to, that we're seeing there? Yeah, um, I'm not very much an expert on this. I would attribute it to the ice. It's definitely not like an atmospheric thing just because the, the atmosphere of Mars is like one one hundredth the density of the atmosphere of the Earth, but um, 
yeah, I, I, I would have to look that up a bit more. Um, but maybe, especially along the bottom edge, maybe because there are polar ice caps. So maybe we're seeing yeah. one part where where the ice had, was a little bit more. And it got, it's cold. On yeah, <laughs> it's, it's definitely very cold on Mars. Yeah. Um, speaking of that cold, uh, as some people wonder about going to Mars. Um, uh, Yoko, who'd asked a question before, um, our, our eight-year-old scientist. Um, do you, do you have maybe an idea of um, if you went to Olympus Mons or maybe they want to go to Olympus Mons, um, what would you, what'd you, what would you want to bring? What would be like the number one thing um, if you were at Mars, besides potatoes, what would be the number one thing you bring to Mars? Um, I'd probably bring my bike. Oh, okay. I think it'd be, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to see what the, the mechanics of low gravity and biking are. And I think, I don't know. I like mountain biking. So probably mountain <laughs> mountain biking or on Olympus Mons might be, <laughs> might be a, a fun thing to do. And uh, especially up and down the craters, but yeah, that's, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, that, that is awesome. I, I had literally never thought about bike, biking on Mars before. I <laughs> never even considered it. Um, and Olympus Mons is one volcano. Uh, Hoa Pham has asked, are there, are there volcanoes on Mars? We know there there's one. Um, uh, are any volcanoes active? Um, any uh, any volcanic? Would we see, would we expect to see any eruptions from volcanism on Mars? No, not currently. I uh, I don't know if something will come up later in geologic history, but as of right now, I think everything is volcanically dead. Uh, and I, I'm not. I, I I can't really speak more to that. I don't know if it's like a, a heat dissipation problem, but yeah. There's not that energy there to cause that, that enough eruption here like we see, um, like we see here on Earth I mean, frequently, Why Tonga a few weeks back now. Um, all right, a few more questions. Uh, maybe I might throw that lightning round at you or you, you saw Matt get through it. Can you, can you do that? All right. I'll give it a shot. We'll give it a shot. Okay. Um, oh boy, we had a question about names again. Does each planet have its own term for seismic activity? Earthquakes, Mars quakes, Venus quakes. Would we find Mercury quakes? Would that be? Would we just continue that naming? I think so. I don't know. Well, I I've seen people say Mars quakes, and I've seen Mars Martian earthquakes. Uh, <laughs> so still up for debate, is what we're saying. Still here. up for debate. Yeah. <laughs> um, what is your favorite rock or mineral? What is my favorite? Um, that's a good question. I, five seconds. I think in five seconds, I'll go with the Martian one. I'll go with, um, NWA 7034. So that's, uh, one of our Martian meteorites, uh, NWA. So it's found in Northwestern Africa. It's cool because it is the only, uh, oh, oops. It's the only. Uh, That's okay. What was uh, the name? I'll put it in the chat. What was the name? One more time. NWA seven zero three four. So, so we can't get the image. People, folks, can look up NWA seven zero three four Martian rock. Um, and very quickly, why, why was that? I, I interrupted you. What, what makes it your favorite? Uh, it's my favorite because it's the only sedimentary meteorite. All, every other meteorite is igneous. Uh, granted, uh, NWA 7034 is made up of a lot of classes of igneous rocks, but it's still, it's called, it's considered a polymic breccia, meaning that just, it's, you can I see it. In my backyard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you can kind of see that there's like different classes of different rocks, uh, on like this, this sod surface right here. So the, the cla classes would be the, the different different bits of rock inside the larger structure? Yeah, exactly. A, a bunch of different class or a bunch of bits of rock then got like concreted together. And then at some point it got blasted off the surface of, of Mars and it ended up on earth. And it's the only sedimentary meteorite that we have or a sedimentary Martian meteorite that we have. Nice. Well, um, unique rock, good, good for favorite. Um, can you quickly, I mean, very quick, I mean, this is, this I feel like is a, is a big question though. So let's maybe take a little more time. Uh, two folks, Tom and Holly, both wondering, um, 
what gives you confidence that a rock found on Earth came from Mars? Or, you know, how do we know that this particular rock, how do we know that NWA 734, um, Allen Hills, how do we know that isn't just uh, a very cool Earth rock? Um, yeah, that's that's an excellent question. Uh, <laughs> I know I that they just love to lick rocks to find out what's going on with them. Can you, have you ever licked a Martian rock? Uh, you know, let's come back to that. Oh, no. How do we know, how do we know it's from Mars? <laughs> Not licked any Martian rocks. I've licked plenty of rocks, but not none Martian. <laughs> um, okay, so I mean, you can tell if a rock is a meteorite if it has shock textures. So if there's uh, minerals that had to have been formed at extremely high pressures uh, that wouldn't be stable on the surface, then you know it's a meteorite. So for example, in this class, or in this, sorry, not class, in this, you can see a mineral here of masculinite which is what happens when you alter the mineral plagioclase feldspar at like 20 to 30 gigapascals. And that, um, would, that would be that darker, that darker section there. Yeah. And so very high pressure uh, temperature. Is that? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so in, or in terms of understanding uh, whether there, whether a rock is Martian or terrestrial, there's a really boring answer, which is, uh, uh, we look at what's called a triple oxygen isotope plot. And so uh, basically this is just looking at, uh, there's different ways that oxygen isotopes are fractionated on different planets. And so terrestrian, uh, terrestrial uh, rocks will have oxygen isotopes that plot on this bottom line. And then Martian rocks will have uh, uh, oxygen isotopes that plot on this line. And I believe that there's different fractionation lines for different planets that have been verified with, uh, with surface measurements. Um, but I think the more exciting answer, although albeit very limited, is found in this guy. So this is EET 79001 uh, found in the elephant moraine region in Antarctica. And so when it was shocked, it generated a melt. So as soon as it got blasted off the surface of Mars, there's a lot of heat generated and it melts the surface prim uh, partially. And in this specific rock, uh, it trapped some of the atmospheric gases of Mars. And so there's, in the melt, there's little gas bubbles and back in the 80s, people actually were able to match that uh, gas composition with the gas composition recorded by the Viking landers in, that were placed on the moon, or sorry, on Mars in like the 70s. And so that was like the first time where it's like, like this has like a signature of the Martian surface and it also shows this uh, oxygen isotope trend that's been uh, heavily like corroborated with different uh, Martian meteorite compositions. So going back to that, for I mean, getting a chance then to do uh, in situ on Mars measurement, really giving us that 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 ground truth. I think you know we used earlier for remote sensing, but ground truth on Mars compared to what we see here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, Going back, there was a question, you know, or very early on, I asked Matt this, um, I, he, he said, um, well, it was a question, uh, if, if, if Mars rocks were rock music, bands, artists, or songs, um, what, what would you choose? What music, what music describes Mars to you? Yeah, so I got to see this question a while back, and I, I always had it in the back of my head to keep thinking about it. Um, I would probably think of it as some type of like frenetic, but like bare bones jazz. So very just like high pace, like bebop, just hard to figure out where anything is going. Like Thelonious Monk stuff. Yeah, I, I, that's, that's what I would attribute to Mars. Just kind of like structured unstructuredness, right? Yeah. I, I don't, yeah, I, I, I don't know a good way to describe that either. That's, fan, that's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> Jazz for Mars. All right, I like this. Um, we need to get all you scientists together. I mean, half y'all play instruments anyway. Um, we need to get us all together and just start a jam band here. Um, 
All right, I think we got, uh, I wanna throw a couple more questions at you because um, they're, they're things I've been wondering actually. And um, going back again to something that was talked about earlier in terms of what do we know, what are we, what are we wrong about, um, but also complexity. We had that, you had that map there of Mars. Um, do you mind, are you able to jump back to that? Um, yeah. I'm wondering maybe if um, something I was just wondering as I looked at it here, um, I, I've seen, I, I've got a chance to see great maps of this. Um, there's one of, of Titan, a, a moon of Saturn released a while back. Uh -huh. um, we've got, um, we've Sorry. got maps. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. We, we've got these maps. Um, and they're definitely like, there's a lot going on there, right? Like a lot. Um, but maybe we could make a point of comparison. Maybe, maybe you could help me with this. How does this compare to Earth? Like if I saw a map of Earth like this, um, would I be seeing the same, however it's color code, the same different types of regions? Is this more, is this, is this less? Um, is this unique, is this different? So the main reason it's, or the main thing that's really different about it is, again, Mars doesn't have plate tectonics. And so if you were to think about rocks that are deposited on the surface, it would just be like one layer after another, after another. And if there were no events, we would only be able to see that top layer. We wouldn't be able to see anything below it. But the other thing about Mars is it's heavily cratered. And so we can see a lot of different uh, rock, like a lot of different ages of rocks from the craters uh, uh, that expose all the older rocks. Uh, on Earth, the reason we can see older rocks is because we have uh, plate tectonics forcing some rocks to subduct under others, causing some of them, some of them to, uh, to fold and erode away. Uh, you won't, there's, there's not much cratering on earth just because we have like a thick atmosphere that protects us from the craters, as well as any crater that was prevalent or most craters that were, that did affect the surface are then covered over by like erosion of sediments. Uh, I mean, the fact that we don't, we have not as or little erosion on Mars and the fact that it's such a heavily cratered surface, but that gives us like this very crazy pattern. On Earth maps, you can kind of uh, delineate like how the, uh, you can try and figure out how the crust has been folding, how tectonic uh, activity has been uh, messing with the geometry of the surface. Uh, this, you don't see that, but you see a lot of different rocks from craters. So, so we've got some big differences. Okay. So that, so we've got some big differences and I, I might not expect to see as much, but, but globally then, I mean, we're, we're also looking at a snapshot on, on earth sort of instance, a snapshot, um, of a constantly changing planet. So, um, so I yeah. can just look, I couldn't really look at a map. Maybe a good answer, a good way for me to think about this then is, is I can't really compare the two. We've got very different things happening on these worlds. It's not really an A to B comparison. Definitely. And I would think that arguing extraterrestrial planets is a lot harder than arguing Earth, although, or mapping Earth, although I very much struggle with mapping Earth <laughs> anytime I've had the opportunity to do so. Well, maybe one thing. So there, there, it's been mentioned along the way. There's a lot of debates, you know, um, in terms of, you know, what we know, what we don't know, what, what we're going to change, what, what is, what's going on with this, what's going on with that. Um, is there anything maybe in your fields, especially, I mean, any big things you do agree on? I mean, is there something you don't um, need to write a, a thesis paper on, I guess? Um, where do we stand with our knowledge of Mars? What are some big truths, ground truths we know about Mars? Um... Are we sure it's there? Because you don't, I, now I'm worried a little bit. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, okay. I think we're sure it's there. Uh, Breaking news, people, Mars might not be there anymore. Hold on tight to your seats. So I think one thing that the community is settling to agree on, and this is related to Mars is like relatively small size compared to the other planets, uh, especially like this far out of the solar system, but definitely compared to like Venus and Earth, um, is that when Mars was accreted, usually uh, planetary embryos will accrete and get bigger, but then they'll be colliding with other large planetary embryos. And that creates 
like mixing processes, whole planet melting processes. Uh, I think a lot of people have come to the agreement that Mars's small size uh, has just come from, it accreted a lot of dust as a planetary embryo, and then it wasn't really perturbed that much. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of trace element um, uh, data that supports that. Uh, and that's specifically based on uh, a lot of heavier metals uh, would segregate to the core, but if there was any later, uh, like uh, there's any later collisions, the amount of heavy ad, uh, elements that would segregate to the core would be affected by that. But we, based on the solubility of heavy metals, we believe that like the Mars has kind of just, it just grew to the size of like a planetary embryo and then it was kind of left alone. Also, another thing that points to that is that Mars started to grow uh, a crust really early. So the other notable thing about the Allen Hills 84001 rock, the, the life rock, uh, is it's also one of the oldest pieces of uh, Martian crust. And that's dated at 4.1 billion years old, which is older than, it's not older than the earth, but it's older than any recorded rock on the earth. Uh, and so the fact that we have that means that Mars did form a crust really early. So it probably wasn't perturbed by big collisions and big melting events, uh, the same way Venus and Mars were during its accretionary history. So it, had, it did have a quieter formation. Quieter. Yeah. Yeah. I that's, mean, that's, that's a good, a good yeah, and that's a good thing to agree on. If we sort of, I think then if we get in a good idea of where it's been, maybe some of this work later on becomes a little bit more, uh, I won't say simple, it's not simple, right? Um, <laughs> a little straightforward, but maybe, maybe a little more straightforward. Um, all right, we are reaching to the end of our time. Um, there are a few more questions in the, the Q&A that, I, that I, um, I'm gonna ask if you are free to stick around to answer as well. Uh, yeah, gladly. Might be a bit of a debate there um, in terms of right and wrong as we go as we go there. Um, oh, you know what? Let me ask. Actually, no. I do want to ask one more question because a great question we got earlier. Um, have you always been interested in this? I, did have you always just been like, yeah, this is great? Um, or did you come? I mean, how did this all start? <laughs> yeah, no. It's like I I had a I had a weird path to science. So when I was in high school, probably like my sophomore or junior year of high school. I was like, okay, what do I enjoy the most? I enjoy being in marching band. I want to be a marching band director. My parents weren't super happy about that idea. And they're like, you should do some sort of science. And I like, it's like, no, I, that's kind of lame. I'm not that good at science. Uh, but then I heard that my neighbor, uh, Haley, she just started when I was like a sophomore, she started her undergraduate in geology. And I never thought of geology before. I was like, okay, I do like studying science. And I think being outside would be cool. I don't know anything about rocks, but uh, maybe I'll study geology. And so I started in college and I was like very open with the fact, like if I didn't like it at all, I would switch to anything else. Um, but I ended up really liking it. And I also ended up really liking my chemistry classes. And so I was thinking, I was like, man, I just want to do something where I can not only learn about chemistry, but I, I also got involved with like teaching a lot of chemistry. And so it's like, I want to have a future where I can teach and I can teach at the highest level and maybe study like the coolest geochemistry stuff I can find. And, and so that's where I kind of got dragged into this igneous petrology field. Uh, just because, or experimental petrology, just doing a bunch of like melting experiments and figuring out how elements are distributed uh, between melt and like minerals. Uh, in my first project, it was looking at how elements are distributed between uh, like a mantle and a core and modeling that. And so, yeah, I started getting interested in planetary science very late. And it was mostly just like, I want to teach and I want to like, study something that's interesting. I want to use my love of chemistry in the coolest way I can think of. And that's, that's where, uh, that's how I got here. A, lo a, a bit of a long and winding road as, yeah. as many people, as I will say for myself as well, as, as, as many people experience. Um, 
I won't, I won't ask the, the rude question about being in a PhD program, but I, maybe I'll ask you this. Um, uh, what, uh, what are you hoping to do next? Are you, are you sticking with experimental uh, petrology, um, sticking with Mars? Are you, are you looking elsewhere? What are, you, what are you excited about out there? In the... Yeah, um, I'm def I mean, I'm excited about Mars, but uh, I don't know. I, I really like uh, thinking about, um, so right now I'm looking at like relatively modern magmatism, just once everything is solidified, once you're having volcanoes coming from the partial melting of mantle rock, uh, that's what I'm looking at. And it's, it's very neat, but I'm, I'm really interested in studying like planetary accretion and looking at like core mantle differentiation. So once all the dust collapsed on itself, and then once everything melted from like the decay of heat producing radiogenic nuclides, as well as like collisions, how do like elements distribute amongst themselves and how can we like study that in a way without making too many assumptions and studying that res responsibly. Uh, and that, that's, that's kind of what gets me excited for the future. Excited for the future by looking billions of years back in the past. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's very cool. I mean, that's very, that is very <laughs> exciting. Um, well, I wish you the best of luck. Um, and another round of applause for everyone here. Uh, please give a round of applause on your side of the screens uh, for, for uh, Sanat. Uh, thank you so much um, for sharing your work, uh, for answering these questions. Uh, as I was saying, there are a few more questions if you're free to stick around to answer them. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left, folks. Um, we somehow went way past what I thought was going to happen. I thought we were going to be in and out of here and just get an early evening or something. Um, I guess not. Uh, no, in fact, for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to cover the next decade of space exploration. Um, so I'm going to take over the screen share. And don't worry, it's not going to be that bad, folks. Um, uh, I am, I'm going to go through a little bit of what to look out for. Um, and believe it or not, I'm going to skip a lot of my slides. So this is good for everyone. Uh, let's just find that particular one. Um, yes, what else is happening in space here? Uh, so the answer to this actually, it, it becomes very simple. You know, as I started looking into this, um, what else, what else is happening? What else is going on? Um, really simple. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, whether it is what is going on right now, the Hubble Space Telescope, over 30 years up in space, it is tired. I know, I know the feeling, Hubble, we've all, we've been there. Um, but it is still working. It is still had a few glitches, but it is still going just recently, just from the most recent things it's done, studying the outflows of gases in the dwarf starburst galaxy, Hennes 210. Um, studying how uh, accretion within a, around a black hole is then triggering star formation uh, thousands of light years away. Uh, Juno is at Jupiter, and it is one of my absolute incredible, most favorite spacecraft ever. Um, Juno has been around Jupiter for uh, going on five years now. Its mission is continuing out till at least 2025. Uh, it is making close flybys of Jupiter to study the interior of Jupiter which is just as hard as studying the interior of the rocky worlds. Um, it is also getting looks at moons, the moons of Jupiter. This is an image um, uh, done by uh, Thermopolis uh, of Ganymede. Um, all, uh, but it, in here in just a little while, uh, make sure I get my date here, uh, in late September uh, the, of this year, 2022, Juno is swooping by Europa. It's going by within about uh, 200 miles of Europa's surface. I'm um, gonna give us some beautiful images of that. These images that it takes with the Juno cam are available for everyone to, to use um, at missionjuno.swery.edu slash Juno cam slash processing. We'll put that in the chat, hopefully. Um, there's some great artwork being done um, by Scottson 425, uh, how storms are formed on Jupiter, um, a lovely one as well as the most beautiful image I've seen. Uh, this is Jupiter, but done by Rometto 92. Um, it's 24 by 24 inches. It's mixed media on wood. Um, so if you are an artist, if you love space, if you love Jupiter, uh, check out Juno Cam from the Juno mission. It's ongoing. It's gonna get some beautiful images that you can work with however you like. 
Um, mentioned, you know, we talked. Oh, we talked about Mars. Uh, Curiosity still going on Mars. Um, our longest operating rover on Mars. It has set several records. Um, it has drilled and sampled over. Uh, it has now drilled 37 holes on Mars and taken uh, three uh, dirt samples, um, 40 total. Then uh, it has also traversed uh, almost 2,000 feet in elevation. Uh, these are all records from Mars, and it's given us some incredible, beautiful images of uh, in here some of a sedimentary pattern. Um, we talked about sedimentary rocks, uh, so we talked about sedimentary rocks a bit there. Um, where we think flowing water was. So water in the past of Mars, thinking about that life there in the past. The amazing new in perseverance and ingenuity there. Coming up on a year on Mars, February 18th was the, the anniversary of the landing. Um, this is perseverance here. Uh, this is ingenuity. Ingenuity is the helicopter on Mars. If you can't see it, it's right there. Um, that little thing there, about 12 inches, 12 inches uh, or so in size, 12 by 12. Uh, a little uh, helicopter on Mars that is made now over, I think we're at 18 flights. I think we're prepping for the 19th flight right now. Yes, we've flown almost 20 times on the surface of Mars. Ingenuity is amazing. Um, there is also, uh, as mentioned, and I didn't put it in here, I apologize to the InSight team. The InSight uh, lander is uh, back uh, online. Uh, there was some dust covering solar panels, but it is still working on Mars as well. Um, checking our questions. Um, We've, all, we've still got that chat open. Uh, if you've got things to share, we've also got the Q&A open if there is anything you are wondering about. Uh, thank you, Katrina, for putting those links in there. And yes, going through that, thank you, uh, everyone. Yeah, please put your thanks into uh, to Sanat and Matt as well um, for their, their incredible work. Um, Mary, I'm gonna, let, I'm gonna let Sanat answer that question. I, and I hope he's actually seen Dune um, because that was an incredible movie. Um, all right, just a few other things going on in space. Um, SpaceX is continuing to launch Starlink satellites, ruining everyone's view of the night sky. A few more went up the other day. James, JWST uh, is working operational. Uh, it just got, they are working on aligning its mirrors. JWST, James Webb Space Telescope, uh, working like per just perfectly. It's been the most, as I've heard it described, the most boring deployment ever because everything has gone to plan which is what everyone wants to happen. Uh, orbiting out to there, cooling down. Uh, if you want to link to what is happening right now, there's a short link there. Uh, apologize to our people behind the scenes. I don't think I had that one in our document, but uh, a Z link there, it'll be up for a second. Looking closer to home. Um, if, you, uh, if you're interested in more of how we get to places, um, there's a very cool project going on right now, launched a few years back. Uh, called Light Sail 2. Um, it looks like this. It's pretty small. It's a, a CubeSat. That right there is only about 12 inches high, the main body of it. You can see some solar panels coming off it. Uh, Light Sail 2 is a project um, from the Planetary Society, and it's being used to demonstrate controlled solar sailing within low Earth orbit. So developing new ways to move around in space. Um, these are a few images of it. Um, on the left is showing Hurricane, let me make sure I get her name right here, or excuse me, Tropical Storm uh, Marine uh, near Japan. Uh, the image on the right is showing the Bahamas, and I'm jealous. Um, but it's an ongoing project. It's working wonderfully, which is very exciting. Um, finally, just a few other things here. Oops, uh, Oh, uh, at, at Kasuki, uh, at Venus, um, the Venus Climate Order from the Japanese Space Agency also still going on, um, doing more work mapping Venus's atmosphere, hopefully joined, as we'll see in a minute here, by a few other spacecraft too. All right, and then just a few other things happening to Earth there. Um, read quickly, there's a lot going on. We're launching new people to space in every way from public um, agencies like NASA to private and public uh, collaborations like Boeing and NASA. Um, there are new missions planned out to uh, new space telescope plan to study things like dark energy, to study the sun. Um, uh, shout out to, to India and ISRO. Uh, the, uh, they have an uncrewed launch of their human capable spacecraft happening here in 2022. In 23, they're hoping to launch their first astronauts into space. Um, so uh, shout out to them, fingers crossed. Um, they, uh, they've done amazing work at the moon and Mars, uh, ISRO has, uh, so it's gonna be very exciting. 
Um, also, quick note here about the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, the next infrared space telescope. This is a personal favorite of mine, uh, named after Dr. Nancy Grace Roman, um, a pioneering American astronomer um, in the mid, uh, early mid 20th century, uh, earned her PhD in about 49 for some, some timeline. Uh, she worked at NASA and in part, um, this next telescope is named after her because of the work that she did gathering scientists together to advocate for the great, uh, what became the great space telescope, Hubble. Um, so the mother of Hubble is getting her own telescope in space. Um, it, is, it is amazing. Uh, the Roman Space Telescope, originally known as W First, for those who, who keep up on, on space news, the Roman Space Telescope, I would say, is the true successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. It's about eight feet uh, wide, eight feet wide mirror. It looks in roughly the same wavelengths, visible in infrared, um, but it does a little bit more. Uh, on the left there, that little inset is what the Hubble sees of the galaxy M31. This is what the Roman Space Telescope will see. A little bit more. Thanks to a different set of optics, it will have a view of space 20, uh, 20 times what Hubble will see. It will capture uh, more light faster, allowing us to make even more discoveries than we've already done. Um, thank you, David, yes. Uh, it will hopefully launch here, um, you know, getting into the 2020s. Uh, telescopes do take a while to, to put together. Um, so I would, I would I'd expect to see that delayed a little bit, um, but when it does get up there, um, it will be incredible. Um, again, just a view of what Hubble sees. Nothing against Hubble here, Hubble's amazing. Um, these are the pillars of creation within the Eagle Nebula. Uh, Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope will see the entire nebula all at once. Um, it's going to be very cool. Uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, heading outwards, looking at the moon, um, a few more things. Uh, for those uh, also keeping up with the news, um, in a month, literally one month, the second stage of the Discover rocket, um, which took one of our satellites into space, um, it will impact the far side of the moon. I believe it's roughly around 12 uh, universal time on March 4th. Regardless, it is on the far side of the moon, so we won't see this impact, um, although that might change a little bit. So keep an eye out for that on March 4th. Just, you know, make sure you look up that day. Um, and as well, coming up here sometime in the early 2022, Artemis 1 will hope, hopefully launch. Um, I'm very excited for it to launch whenever it does launch. Um, there's a lot going on at the moon. Um, in fact, I have an entire second slide of everything happening in just the next few years of what's going on at the moon from NASA, as well as other space agencies. The moon is the, the hot place to be in the solar system, ironically, um, from China to Korea to, uh, in, to, uh, to private agencies as well, um, going to the moon, landing on the moon, studying the moon. Um, it's the next step we really need to take because when we wanna get further out, the moon is gonna be the, the place for us to help understand how to get out there. Um, uh, looking at Venus, just a few things. Um, we haven't been to Venus in years and the Veritas Da Vinci and Envision trili uh, Trinity of spacecraft will help, uh, fair to say, I think, redefine our view of this world. Um, Matt back there might be just, going yay about, about mentioning these. Um, these will help give us some incredibly new information about the planet. Um, da Vinci landing on it for the first time in decades hasn't been done since the 70s with the, uh, the Venera probes from the, the USSR. Um, uh, Veritas, their top middle is an orbiter, which along with the Europeans uh, Envision satellite will help us measure the atmosphere and activity within it and hopefully see what, if anything, is, is going on it. Um, Akasuki there from Japan was uh, studying uh, lightning on Venus and found absolutely no evidence, telling no evidence of lightning whatsoever, which is actually kind of cool because it tells us that there's not that activity in the atmosphere. Um, finally, Mars, slightly slower time as I, as I was researching for Mars. Um, it does take a little longer to get there, about six months, um, then, then it takes to get to the moon. But ExoMars in particular, um, meant to launch uh, last or two years ago, um, will be launching this year as we head towards um, opposition with Mars. 
uh, the next uh, lander from, uh, from ESA as well as a collaboration with the Russian space program. And also from JAXA, uh, from the J uh, Japanese Space Agency. Uh, they're doing incredible work. And in particular, uh, the Martian moon's exploration, MIX, M MIP, MIMS? I don't know how you pronounce the X there. Uh, this is a mission um, that will re hopefully return a sample from the Martian moon Phobos. It will hopefully land twice on the surface and then bring a sample from the moon Phobos, the closest moon to Mars, back here to Earth, as well as doing a flyby of uh, Deimos, the moon in the background there. Uh, we know very little about these moons. Uh, talk about things that are debated, whether these are part of Mars that got ejected outwards, whether they're captured asteroids, a lot of questions up in the air. Um, Phobos, though, in particular, has also been floated as a possible way uh, for people to, uh, a possible, essentially, uh, asteroid space station around Mars. We could go there and use that as the staging ground to then go down, up from up and down from Mars. So very, I'm very excited for this. Um, I'm very, uh, you know, fingers crossed, edge of my seat. Um, go JAXA. Speaking of asteroids, um, there's a lot going on with them. Um, the, uh, the DART mission, many of you know, might know, is actually one of ongoing mission. DART is uh, headed to Didymos and Diamorphos. Um, we have other missions from the NIA Scout, um, as well as the Psyche spacecraft. And in 23, uh, September 23, OSIRIS-REx, on a very long journey back home, will drop off some uh, samples of the asteroid Bennu, a sample collection that went beautifully. Um, more samples than I think they ever expected to get will be coming home. Also, I needed, uh, I needed its own slide for it. The Lucy spacecraft launched a few months ago uh, is making uh, three flybys of the Earth and flybys of eight different asteroids um, to study things, the, the Trojan asteroids around Jupiter, where things we know are there, we've never seen them in any detail before. Um, we're gonna learn an incredible amount about near Jovian space. Um, a few other things here uh, from Jupiter as well. The JUICE, which is talk about acronyms there, right? So not, um, uh, Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, JUICE. Mm, all right. Um, it is going to be the first, moon uh, first mission dedicated to the Jovian moons. Um, everything else is dedicated to saying Jupiter itself, which is cool. Um, but in that same time frame, uh, 23 to sometime between 23 and 25, the Europa Clipper, which will study the moon Europa specifically, uh, learning more about the water, the liquid water underneath the moon's surface. Uh, and what, I don't know, what else might be going on in there? I don't know, space whales. Um, and then finally mentioned there, Dragonfly. Uh, we're flying on Mars in 26, launching in 26, getting there hopefully in the early 2030s, the quadcopter on the moon Titan, Saturn's moon Titan. We're gonna land a quadcopter on a moon. Um, about a billion miles away from us. And uh, it's, I just, it's, I, I don't even have words for this one. I'm very excited to see this develop um, and very excited to see it get there. Uh, stay tuned about a decade out here now. Um, yes, thank you, David, I do. Please, on, on your side of the screens, for those, uh, I know we're reaching out of our time here, for those that are still there, raise a glass uh, to Dragonfly. Uh, finally, just a little further away in space and time, um, end of the decade, asteroid Apophis will be passing by the Earth uh, about 20,000 miles away. Just keep an eye on that one. Um, got the name Apophis for a reason. Um, in 2231, on April 5th, starting on April 5th for the next 20 years, Pluto will be closer to the sun than Neptune. Um, its orbit moves inside it. So mark your calendars there. Also, around that same time, uh, SpaceX will finally launch people to Mars. It will be a one-way trip, so please, um, please make sure you, you understand the risks there. Uh, and finally, in the year 4 million, uh, Pioneer 11, um, one of our first interstellar probes, um, will fly by the star Lambda Aquilae. It will be long since cooled down to zap, almost absolute zero, uh, power source long depleted, but Pioneer 11 out there, out there in the cosmos, uh, billions of miles away now and getting even further. All right, we've reached the end of our time tonight, um, but I will give a shout, uh, shout out to one of my favorite books that I've read in the past year, um, The Last Stargazers by Emily Levesque. If you are interested in what's happening in space, you should understand what's gone on before. The Last Stargazers covers some of the history of 
studying the sky from naked eye observations to great telescopes here on Earth to telescopes in planes, Sophia. Um, the Last Stargazers has a little bit of everything for everyone. Uh, one of my favorite reads, um, indeed, a joyous adventure through modern astronomy. All right, um, with that, we're reached to the end of our time, but please join us for more virtual events this weekend coming up tomorrow, Saturday 5th at 11 a.m. Spectacular Spacecraft Extraordinary Missions with Stacy Ledecky from the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, Stacy uh, Tadekin, uh, Tadekin uh, is, is a fantastic speaker. Um, and then on Sunday, Moon, Mar Moon Mars, and Beyond, uh, another virtual program with our NASA Solar Systems Ambassador. Check out more at z.umn.edu slash space dash fest dash 2022. That will also get thrown in the chat there. Thank you, Katrina, already on it. Um, and thank you to our Bell 150th anniversary presenting sponsor, General Mills. This is the 150th anniversary of the Bell. 150 years we've been around and we're there's a lot more going on in the next 150. Um, but uh, General Mills sponsoring us for this, um, and author Ruth and John Huss, uh, they sponsored our observation deck, even if we don't always get to use it, and they have sponsored and continue to sponsor our astronomy, Minnesota's astronomy classroom program, including our Space Fest, our virtual programs. Uh, fantastic, uh, fantastic folks, fantastic foundation. Um, thank you for your continued support. Uh, it allows me to, to sit here and talk about space for a couple hours, so just thank you so much. Uh, and also thank you um, to uh, everyone who has donated to the Bell, whether that's through just a direct membership, uh, direct donation, if you've joined as a member, um, every little bit counts. Um, when all, of, when one of us shines, all of us shine. Um, if you'd like to give as well, z.unm.edu slash bell give, um, if you'd like to make your own donation. Um, and uh, with that, you know, that is the last slide I've got. Thank you all so much for those who've stuck around through two hours of exploring space. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you again to our presenters there, Matt and Samat. If you want to, if you want to turn back on for a second, audio V, uh, and say hi, bye. Um, thank you. Thanks for hosting, Tad. This was this is my first time attending, and it was, it was really great to see everything. You're great presentation, welcome. Matt. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And you did a fantastic job too, Sana. All right, well, we look forward to having both of you back at some point. Um, when you do find aliens, uh, you have to come and tell us first, okay? This, right, yeah? They're a little quiet over there, but I'll take the yeah, eyes. Okay, I saw that nuts. All right, um, thank you. And everyone have a great night, stay safe, stay warm, um, and, uh, and enjoy, enjoy Minnesota winter. All right, have a great night, everyone. <laughs>